All right, thanks, Andy, and thanks, everyone, for joining us both uh, in person and those of you joining us uh, online and those of you who have uh, been submitting questions. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, hearing from the Secretary on those questions. Um, uh, as Andy said, we are uh, here today with uh, the Secretary of Energy, uh, Dr. Stephen Chu, who will be um, talking uh, briefly about the uh, energy and innovation agenda that the President outlined last night and giving you that in some more detail. Um, and then he'll be taking questions uh, both from our online audience and from those of you here in person. Um, for those of you who are watching online, uh, we in, uh, invite you to continue submitting your, your questions throughout uh, the, the, the event uh, via email and Facebook and Twitter using hashtag CHU. And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, uh, invite uh, Secretary of Energy to offer us some of his thoughts. Where do you want me? Okay. All right, thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to first thank you for being here and uh, for all those out there in Etherland and cyberspace also for joining us. Uh, I just want to briefly make a couple comments before uh, handing over the questions. Uh, last night, President Obama laid out a strategy for America to create jobs and win the future. And there were central themes going throughout his remarks. One was, uh, first and foremost, was unleashing the innovation machine in the U.S., and I'll have more to say about that. But part of it also is improving the education uh, of Americans so that our young people have the skills to compete. And another is uh, we have a mature infrastructure, and uh, we need to rebuild that infrastructure to be more competitive going forward. That, too, will create many, many jobs and help us become competitive in the future. So let me talk about uh, energy. Uh, the President talked about a Sputnik moment. Uh, what was the Sputnik moment of 1956, I believe it was? Um, uh, a little grapefruit-sized globe starts circling around the Earth, passing over the United States. Um, and clearly, uh, it showed that at that point in time, the Soviet Union had a space technology that was superior to the United States. We were not able to put up a satellite. And it was a wake-up call. We had fallen behind technologically. And with regard to that, uh, President Eisenhower said uh, remarkably that uh, the response is not to put more money into missiles, uh, but the response is to look at our science infrastructure, our education infrastructure, and in the long run, this is what's going to make us competitive. Then in, I think it's 1961, 1962, uh, President Kennedy, in a, two speeches, now known as his moonshot speeches, say, by the end of this decade, we will put a man on the moon. We will lead in this space race. And so the Sputnik moment is the realization that today's Sputnik moment is the realization that we are no longer the technological leaders in all the sectors of innovation that we would like to be, that we have lost the lead in some of these instances, uh, many of them having to do with energy, that other countries have recognized that the energy technologies the world will need in the future are now being developed not only in the United States, but most notably in China and Korea and Japan and in Europe. These are our competitors. Um, and so the, it's the realization that technological leadership and innovation cannot be taken for granted. Now, having said that, the President also said that we do have the greatest innovation machine in the world. And with given the right direction, uh, we can use this innovation machine to be competitive in all those things. In a world where we expect oil prices to be higher, in a world where we expect the world will need cleaner sources of energy, uh, where uh, we will need uh, to be able to generate energy from the sun, the wind, and other things. Uh, and in a way where it's a race to make those sources of energy competitive with our current generation sources of energy with fossil fuels. Because the people who win in that will certainly have a head up on what you can sell internationally on this, in this market. So the President called for the creation of three new energy innovation hubs. 
As you know, these are hubs where you put scientists and engineers, ideally on the same roof, marching towards a common goal. Uh, it needs to do the scientific discovery, but it also needs to do the things that can actually lead to the private sector picking it up and taking it to the marketplace. Um, and these innovation hubs you can think of as the Apollo projects of our time in various sectors of the energy industry. The President also re reiterated his commitment to putting a million advanced uh, technology vehicles on the road by 2015. And this goes uh, that will greatly reduce our dependence on foreign oil and jumpstart the American auto industry. It is, uh, quite frankly, another race. Uh, countries all over the world have recognized that uh, the electrific electrification of personal vehicles and uh, city and uh, suburban driving could offload a lot of the dependency on imported oil. Uh, and the country that, and the industries that develop the technologies where you can go 300, 400 miles on a single charge in a vehicle that's cost competitive with today's internal combustion engines will win big. Um, let me give you an example, uh, and this is an, indeed an announcement. Um, uh, the national labs uh, are doing a great deal in the research and development. Um, Department of Energy's Argonne National Laboratory, which has been a leader in advanced battery R&D, has developed some cutting, uh, cutting edge cathode technology. Uh, this technology has now been licensed and further developed by a California-based startup called Envia. And it's received funding from RP. This company has received funding from RP. So today, I'm pleased to announce that General Motors has signed an agreement to use the Envia advanced battery technology as it develops the cars of the future, the successor to the current batteries going into the Volt. And that's just one example. Let me turn to uh, solar energy. Right now, photovoltaic solar energy costs more than uh, electricity being generated by fossil fuel. And again, in response to the Sputnik moment uh, and calling for a moonshot by President Kennedy, the Department of Energy has a similar sunshot. And, and so this is, uh, we looked at what companies are doing today, what they have in their business plans, and what we can do to accelerate these things, to drive down the cost of electricity generation by photovoltaics. So before the end of this decade, we believe, with Department of Energy Research and Development help, we can drive the cost of electricity generation from photovoltaics to be competitive with fossil fuels without subsidy. Now, imagine a world where that is true, and before the end of this decade, then, and if we're the developers of this technology, this is a huge worldwide market, and it will just take off. And it is a, going to be a race of which countries, which companies develop these technologies. Finally, to drive the innovation, innovation machine more broadly, the President has set a very ambitious goal of having 80 percent of America's electricity generation come from clean fuel sources by 2035. Now, it's that you might say, oh my gosh, is that overly ambitious? Well, first, you have to understand uh, from what the basis point, if we look at all the ways we generate electricity uh, with uh, working definition, and this has to be fleshed out in our discussions with Congress, because this is going to be a cooperative venture. It needs, uh, from its very roots, bipartisan support. Roughly speaking, Right now, we're about 40 percent clean energy, the way you can define it. If you t define it in a very strict way of just no carbon emissions, uh, that includes hydro, uh, hydropower, sun, wind, nuclear, we're over 30 percent. And so if you put it in that context, it, is it ambitious? Yes. The moonshot was ambitious. Is it uh, over the top? We can't achieve that? No. We think we can achieve that and again before the end of this decade. So uh, we are in a race. In my way of thinking, this race is much more important in terms of the prosperity of not only five years, ten years from today, but next year and the year after that. Uh, this is an economic race to develop those technologies that the world will demand and want and buy. Uh, and so it's going to have, in many respects, a much more profound influence on our lives going into the future. And this is what the President's calling for. 
We had our Sputnik moment. We watched countries like China aggressively say that everything in the energy efficiency, energy generation sector is a key industry. We're going to do it for ourselves, but we also want to export it. And we can, again, going back to the theme, the American innovation machine is absolutely the best in the world, the most inventive, the best research universities, the national laboratories, the entrepreneurs, you name it. And here's another one that we, our, our, our future jobs, our future wealth will depend on it. And I think we can rise to the challenge. All right? Okay. With that, I'll take questions. Thank you, Secretary Chu. We're going to start with a couple of uh, questions from our online audience, and then we'll move to our in-person audience, and then uh, sort of rotate between the two uh, for as much time as we have. So uh, a question submitted uh, by email from Ivan Graf. Uh, he's quoting the president from last night saying, at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, they're using supercomputers to get a lot more power out of our nuclear facilities. Is the Secretary at liberty to comment on how Oak Ridge National Laboratory is doing this and what gains in terms of efficiency or production are expected? Sure. Uh, there is a short term and there is a long term and mid term view of what we're doing. On the short term, if you look at our nuclear fleet of over 100 reactors, we have been, it's a very good news story, we have been increasingly um, learning to operate the reactors more safely. We've been actually keeping them up longer so they're actually generating power for longer as a period of time. Uh, you know, 20 years ago it was maybe 75 percent of the time they're generating power. Now it's about 92 percent. And we can improve, it, and we can improve that. Um, there will be designs and fuel rods so that we can extract, um, uh, let's say, 2 percent of the energy of the fuel in a fuel rod rather than the 1 percent we have today uh, before you have to shut down and refuel. That means you can go longer on routine refueling maintenance we can improve the output of these reactors. That's in the short term. Uh, doubling the time before refueling is a big deal. But we actually have bigger ambitions uh, of, of actually increasing the productivity of these reactors, uh, a longer term research, extracting more and more of the energy content from the fuel. Not, you know, we're not going to be happy with 2 percent. We want 20, 30, 40 percent. Okay, this is, would be, imagine going from 2 percent to 20 percent. You know, 10 percent, 10 times less fuel for the same amount of electricity generated, 10 times less spent fuel for the same amount of electricity generated. And we want to go even further than that. So this is a research program. But the short term, uh, it will have the effect of effectively out of the 107 or 106 reactors, adding seven or eight new nuclear reactors online with no additional investment because the productivity will increase. So that's a big deal. And, and we intend to use supercomputers for a lot of things like that to improve the productivity of this existing technology and develop new technology. Okay, um, we'll take a, uh, another question uh, by email from Joe uh, Spies, who asks, um, energy storage is, is essential for the development of wind and solar power. Is the DOE going to increase support for energy storage technologies? Uh, very much so. Uh, we have for the first time a concerted look across all the parts of the DOE from the Office of Electricity, from Energy Efficiency, Renewable Energy, from the Office of Science. Energy storage is a very big deal and it occurs in different swaths. Uh, even short-term energy storage helps wind farms become much more productive so they don't have to feather their blades as the amount of wind varies. Uh, and so energy storage in various either at utility scale or short term is a big deal to make our grid more efficient but also as we go to more renewables, uh, which are variable, if we go to you know, 20, 30, 50 percent renewables, we will need an, an ever-increasing amount. And it's a very big part of our research portfolio. Okay. Uh, we'll take a, a question from in the audience. Um, we, I know we do have some members of the media here, and we will have opportunities for media questions at the end. Uh, but, but for the, uh, our invited guests here, if there's a question, can you just identify your name and your organization? Yeah. Should I stand or? Oh, okay. Hi, uh, Secretary Chu. My name is Brett Wiley, and I'm a field organizer at Weather Ice DC, um, which is a program of the DC project that's building an equitable clean energy economy through uh, community-driven weatherization and creation of equitable local jobs here in the DC area. Last night, the president said, we measure progress by the success of our people, by the jobs that they find, and the quality of jobs, by the quality of life those jobs offer. And going to toward 2035, clean energy jobs will be created 
if Congress and communities act on the goal of generating 80% of our energy from renewables. One topic not addressed by the President last night was poverty. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, white unemployment rate is 8.5%, while black unemployment rate is 15.8%. This is just one example of gaps in access to jobs that create a high quality of life for the chronically unemployed, formerly incarcerated, single parents, people of color, and veterans, and those gaps continue to widen. Understanding that you will measure success by the quality of life clean energy jobs create, how will you ensure that those jobs and quality of life are accessible to the chronically unemployed, formerly incarcerated, single parents, people of color, and veterans? Sure. I mean, there are, there are many programs to address those things, um, uh, but let me just say that if you look at what we need to do in order to rebuild an infrastructure, to retrofit homes and buildings, to do all of these things, this will require jobs, this will require jobs over a broad spectrum of Americans. Um, uh, we also want to use this as an opportunity not only to innovate and get the new inventions, but also to, um, to manufacture these products here in the United States. And so uh, we see this as uh, really, in a certain sense, a continuation of what we want to do, that going towards economic prosperity is, is to your point, going towards economic prosperity of a broad swath of Americans in different things. You, where it's from rural America and creating more wealth in rural America to people, uh, to having education programs that can peop get, get people to actually say, okay, you know, we're not looking for jobs only for, um, you know, PhDs or college graduates. We're looking for a quality of jobs across the whole country. And, and you know, as you know, there are jobs, there are jobs um, programs that uh, are we are very supportive of the, uh, people who have been incarcerated, and, and they come out and say, can we help them get a job program? There are job programs for very many people. We think this rebuilding of American infrastructure and uh, going and developing these new industries uh, allows a broad swath of, of the talent in America to be used. Uh, this is something that's a worthy project. Um, it's not something that can be uh, that will require a lot of people. And so here's what you're doing. You're doing something incredibly worthwhile. Uh, uh, you're doing something good for the future populations, the environment, uh, but it's a demand that can't be outsourced. It has to be done here in the United States. So it has all the great things. And we need a larger American workforce to in order to accomplish these goals. So I think it's going to affect them, and we will be very conscious going forward of, of making sure that all Americans have the opportunity to take advantage of this. Um, a a uh, question coming in from Twitter, um, uh, at Aaron Skyme asks, what is your prediction for the biggest clean energy technology impact of 2011, both in America and in the world? 2011? Uh, oh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I just immediately, when I'm asked for predictions, I'm re immediately reminded of what Yogi Berra said, of predictions are are difficult, especially about the future. Um, it's hard to say uh, what, because, because we don't know. There's a lot of things we're investing in, uh, looking for game-changing technologies that could be invented and could come out in 2011. We probably won't be sure that it will be game-changing for another couple of years. So, um, uh, so on the research side, I think there's a lot of exciting things that the Department of Energy invested in. There's an RPE summit, just for a little ad, uh, at the end of February, beginning of March, where, where it's, it takes a particular program and, and looks at, with a year retrospective, of what we've invested in. Uh, with the, in the design of that program was to invest in real home runs, game-changing events. Uh, and uh, although there's no home run we know about for sure, we see a lot of people rounding second and third base, so it's looking good. Um, uh, I think, you know, we have programs to go to energy efficiency where we're going to be piling programs uh, to help uh, bring down the costs of retrofits uh, to overcome a concerted effort across a couple agencies to overcome the financial hurdle of getting a low cost, low interest, uh, long term loans to make. Uh, investments in energy efficiency so that homes and buildings uh, can improve the quality of life and create jobs. 
and meanwhile the Department of Energy and Coordination will supply the information so people will do the, if those pilot programs work uh, that will have a, a tremendous impact because that means you save if you save money by saving energy then it needs no government support in a certain sense except the information transfer right if you provide the mechanism for access to capital and if you provide the information and we're piling with programs uh, so that you can actually drive down the cost of those retrofits. Uh, that will be piling in 2011. That could be a game changer. There's, there's a number of things. Okay, a uh, question from in the audience. I have John Arnes, my Small Business Majority. Um, is there a mechanism for the various agencies in the government to be working together on this, uh, like Department of Commerce, Small Business Administration, Treasury? You already talked about some loan programs. So sure. is there some sort of structure that's being put in place to to deal with the, you know, the fact this is going to overlap a, a number of agencies? Well, there is a structure, um, uh, but there's not only a structure. I mean, um, uh, unfortunately, Cal Brown announced that she's stepping down from the head of the screen cabinet. That will, you know, some structure will continue. But let me say that uh, regardless of the structure, uh, this is, I've been told, I'm a newbie in politics, I don't know what life was like before, but I've been told that this is a highly collaborative cabinet uh, working with the White House. Um, and I know from my own dealings with other cabinet officials, uh, when I go to Sean Donovan and say, you know, we need to do these things, and he gets all excited about it and runs with that, and, and when I go talk to Karen Mills about small business loans, to get, we're talking about the capital investments, it, it resonates very quickly. I work with Tom Vilsack on biofuels. This is wealth creation in rural America with the Department of Interior. So, so virtually no time have any of the cabinet members where they self-assemble or, or assemble in a structure. Uh, is there, you know, this is my turf, what are you doing here? <laughs> I, I have really never seen that, and it's more the opposite, um, uh, where the Secretary of Interior, the Secretary of Agriculture, uh, all these people, uh, we freely say, okay, this is what we're doing, so it creates a unified approach to how to solve these issues, how to how to spur on clean energy and spur on innovation and create wealth in rural America and create uh, Secretary of Labor. So it's creating wealth over a wide swath of society. Um, uh, but we have we have formal structures and that. But the, the most important thing is, and informally, uh, there's a great enthusiasm and we're constantly checking in with each other. I've got this idea. What do you think? at the principal's level. A question uh, from Twitter. Um, at Jewel Bako asks, definition of clean energy include nuclear and clean coal? Question mark. Clean coal tech not real yet. Future aspects? Well, um, right now um, we don't have commercial units operating that take coal, capture it, and sequester it at commercial scale. Uh, that is true. And so the issue is uh, how quickly can we get to this where it's commercially viable at a price point that Americans uh, can deal with. Um, again, this is something which we have taken over the last year and a half a very thorough look at what today's technology, where today's technologies are, where they're going. Uh, also to try to demonstrate in a variety of geological sources that you can sequester uh, for long periods of time safely. Um, uh, I would agree that it's not a slam dunk proven thing today, uh, but you know, but we have a game plan to try to figure out how to get there. Um, in terms of gas, gas by its very nature, it, it roughly speaking emits uh, half the carbon dioxide at, at, as today's uh, coal technologies. Uh, virtually no mercury particulate matter, so it inherently uh, cleaner. But if we're going to meet uh, our climate goals by mid-century, we're going to actually have to be sequestering, capturing carbon from natural gas as well. And so, so but it is a, um, an important part of how we transition. As you may all know, natural gas um, is used for peaking. It, it can be turned on more quickly in today's technology than coal plants. And so as we grow in renewables, there has to be a toggling back and forth very quickly uh, because when the sun stops shining, when the wind uh, stops blowing, you, you don't want blackouts. Energy storage will play an important part of that. Energy distribution will play an important par part of that. Uh, so, so in the next 
couple of decades we're going to need these sources as we integrate them into our variable sources. But in the end, you know, um, I see a very bright future transitioning further and further to renewables, and especially if we can get the price point down and the energy storage and transmission issues solved, um, uh, that will be a natural endpoint. Um, another question from Twitter, uh, from at Millville Green asks, with the end of the stimulus, what specific initiatives will the DOE be funding to support energy innovation? Well, um, what we are doing is we're looking at all the areas, again, with an overall strategy, uh, where does the technology have to go in order to be picked up by the private sector uh, with an endpoint without subsidy? And, and how can the Department of Energy help accelerate that path and make our industries more competitive? And so we're doing this in photovoltaics, we're doing this in transmission distribution systems and smart grid, we're doing this you know, smart grid is a facilitator of sorts, and if done right, it actually um, makes our energy systems much more efficient and also can incorporate variable sources as they go to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent. Um, so what we do, uh, the, the best thing we do is, is in the R&D sector, especially in industries that don't have a tradition for that, and as, as it looks more and more like you want to demo it and deploy it, um, you have to see what does industry do, the, the amounts of funds. I mean, this is a post-stimulus um, um, thing where we will not be having the kind of money to invest in, in helping uh, deploy as much, but we are always looking for how any f precious dollars we are given uh, by Congress, how those precious dollars can be used in the most leveraged sort of way. Uh, and then. It, there's a long explanation, very detailed, but you know, I'd rather handle a few more questions. And especially, Dan tells me, make my answers short. <laughs> uh, Sean Guerin with Environment America. I wanted to, um, first of all, thank you and, and the President for your focus on renewable energy and, and your continued support there. Um, you answered the, the clean coal question, but I think you only covered about half of, of the problem there. So obviously carbon capture and sequestration can handle some of the emissions, but how do you um, move, well, I, I don't see how you would ever make coal clean in terms of how we actually get it, so how mm -hmm. we get it from the ground, mining purposes, and then with hydraulic fracturing and the yeah. demonstrated threat to our drinking water, how do we make that part of the equation clean, or how do we and how fast can we move away from fossil fuels completely? Right. I, I think, uh, yes, you raise um, an important point. Um, uh, the, the ability to extract fossil fuel in a safe and clean way is part of the entire equation. And uh, certainly there are practices uh, like uh, mountaintop removal that could have a profound impact on the environment. Uh, and so uh, that's in the jurisdiction of the EPA, and that's a, certainly a concern. There, there are certain mining practices also that could have severe environmental impacts, and, and there are regulations in the federal government uh, that uh, have to address those things. Um, uh, because if in, in the process of mining, in the process of extracting uh, fossil fuels, there are, uh, can be severe environmental uh, problems. Um, and so the regulatory process is to allow it so that you don't uh, wreak havoc. I mean, uh, having lived for th three or four months, four months, four and a half months on a golf spill issue, um, uh, in the process of helping stop that leak, uh, it, it became very clear that actually for very little money, but, but you know, more thought and, and better processes, you can actually make it much safer. Uh, in terms of uh, natural gas and the fracking, uh, there's, a very, there's, there's similar things um, where, as an example, what you need to do is, is, is that the gas sources are actually below the water tables. And so what you need to do as you try to access those gas sources uh, to make sure that uh, the fluids you use to frack don't get into the freshwater supplies. That's actually uh, a technology that we know about. Uh, 
and we have to make sure it's done correctly. We also have to make sure in the fluids you use that you recover them, you process them, you just can't simply dump them uh, because that, and again, goes out to the water table. But these are things, so the, you know, it can be done safely, it has to be done safely, okay, and, and um, uh, uh, one can do that. And, and so I think the Department of Energy, we, we have a great deal of expertise that fluid moves around the rocks. We need to develop this for carbon capture and sequestration. We need to, to do this for geological storage of radioactive material, all sorts of reasons. And as I happily found out, we have a lot of expertise in our ability to to do engineering calculations and simulations of how this stuff works. So the, all those things can be brought to help the U.S. Uh, uh, in deep water drilling and in fracking for the safety, the environmental impacts. A question from uh, Twitter from at Anna DC Days. Um, the question is, how is, nuclear, how is nuclear clean energy when we have tons of waste with no proven disposal? Um, uh, it's clean in the sense that I think, I've always have said that, that the waste issue is a solvable issue. Um, call me foolish, but I think it's solvable politically, too. <laughs> um, but um, uh, I think um, what, so we have a Blue Ribbon Commission that's looking into this, uh, looking into the options. We now, as I said before, know a lot more than we did in the early 1980s when the Nuclear Waste Act was written. And so it's the charge of that commission will be reporting uh, this summer. Uh, what their recommendations are, and it's a very distinguished commission. Uh, I don't know what they're going to report, uh, but I, I have faith that they're going to give us some good advice on how to go forward uh, with storing spent fuel. And again, we have a long-term research program that wants to see if we can take that used fuel, not spent fuel, I would call it used fuel, and extract more of the energy content out of it in an economical and way that's proliferation resistant. Um, and if we do that, uh, that means you can greatly reduce the amount of uh, end product waste um, greatly. Uh, I don't mean greatly, I don't mean by factor two or so in today's technology, I mean factor 10 or 20 or 50. Uh, all very important stuff. It's a long-term research project but the NRC has just declared that for 50, 60 years, the dry cast storage uh, does not have, pose a threat to the environment. So we have time. I think we had another question from the audience. Hi, my name is Sia Young from Energy Action Coalition. Um, last night, Barack Obama mentioned natural gas, nuclear energy, clean energy. Um, real clean renewable energy is top priority for the millennial generation, the biggest voter block in history, the ones that will bear the brunt of the decisions made today. What will Obama do to ensure clean renewable energy um, technology doesn't harm communities and future generations? Well, uh, first, um, there are many levels of, of, you know, energy has uh, what I would call the effects of local pollution. This is SOX sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, mercury, particulate matter. Um, uh, we have EPA regulations uh, that protect the air at that level, uh, and um, the EPA will continue to do its job. Uh, it also will be looking at greenhouse gases. Then there is what I would call global pollution, uh, where um, uh, the effects of generating energy and the carbon emission will, you know, the climate sciences is each year becoming more and more compelling that there are real risks involved and those risks um, have to be dealt with. And the good news is as uh, the country after country is beginning to realize that um, we're all in this together, there's a risk to be sure. Uh, the wealthier countries, countries like the United States should take leadership positions in this, but uh, even developing countries like China have now openly acknowledged this is an issue. Um, that if we continue business as usual, straight from Premier China, um, climate change would be devastating to China and the rest of the world, as he told me about a year and a half ago. And we're doing something about it. 
but we're also doing something about it because we see a world market where the other, the entire world will need these technologies. So it's again an economic opportunity. Uh, so, um, so this whole focus and when President Obama says he wants to, to be, to have a, a significant re by 2035, a significant reduction uh, of the uh, carbon emissions. This is about that. Does, does that help? I, okay. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, you know, again, the details, uh, as, as we discuss, is and actually how it affects carbon emissions, but it, it really is meant to decrease the carbon emissions um, uh, by some, you know, 50, 60, I forget the exact number. And, and uh, so it is on on an aggressive path to getting to, by mid-century, um, the 80 percent reduction in the United States. Um, Will Conrad on Facebook asks, I'm a graduate student in, bi in a biomedical field, pharmacology, and I'm interested in pursuing bioenergy research. Most of the PIs I talk to say researchers historically head toward biomedical research, not in the other direction. Does DOE have any plans, programs geared to reverse this trend? and get more new biologists into bioenergy? Well, um, yes, we do, of course. But, but the other thing is I would disagree with the assumption. In the past, I would say that many uh, biologists uh, were drawn into biomedical research. Uh, that's where the research money was. That's where the action was, in a certain sense. But over the last decade, uh, rapidly changing. Uh, biology and the power of the new biology uh, can be used to help make significant progress in our energy challenges. And if you, this is why in part why the Department of Energy is so gung-ho on biofuels. Uh, biofuels, uh, next generation going beyond biofuels, it's huge, huge opportunities uh, for that. Uh, because biology has, is such a rapidly advancing science, we, we see that there are incredible opportunities. And we see in the, in the research we fund how rapid the progress is. Now, do we have today something uh, that could produce using, let's say, agricultural wastes, um, wheat straw, uh, corn cobs, uh, l lumber chips, you name it, that can produce uh, gasoline at, uh, let's say, $2 a gallon so it would be competitive in today's market. Uh, not yet, but there is a reasonably high probability we're going to get there at some time. I can't really predict it. Um, but there's a lot of exciting things. I, as many of you may know and may not know, in the last 15 or so years, uh, I've become a kind of a biologist, biophysicist biologist, and, and it's kind of experienced firsthand how powerful these technologies are and, and the opportunities they present. And when I was at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, um, the Joint Institute, JBEI, the Joint uh, JBEI, um, uh, uh, DOE supported organization uh, was started, uh, a collaboration between University of California Berkeley, Berkeley Lab in Illinois. Um, uh, the Energy Biosciences Institute uh, supported by BP. These are things that J. Bay and EBI have already in a year and a half, two years, done remarkable things. Uh, um, yeast and bacteria, when fed simple sugars, produce um, uh, drop in substitutes for gasoline and diesel fuel. Already, private companies have picked up these discoveries and are trying to commercialize them. Uh, we don't know whether it's going to be successful, but the people at J. Bay are continuing, they're doing kind of mini on a bench top, uh, a pilot thing just to see what the production things are because they're not only interested in publishing the paper in Nature that announces this ability to take a whole metabolic pathway and put it into a yeast, but actually to make it commercially viable. So there's great things going on. Whether this is going to be one of the, the landmark discoveries of 2011, I don't know. Uh, because the landmark discovery in my mind is not the Nature paper. It's, oh my gosh, this is going to work commercially. Um, we'll take a question from uh, Mapawat on Twitter. Uh, what is the most cost-effective modification a homeowner can make to their home to save the most energy? 
um, insulation, sealing up leaky air spaces, whether it's a leaky door or window or your ductwork. It's uh, blocking and tackling. <laughs> it's fundamentals. Um, uh, look at your mail slot, and there was a big draft coming out of my mail slot, so I kind of did a little home thing and put a little plastic and put a magnet so it seals up, and then I put a little, and my wife allowed this, bless her heart, a little uh, quilt on top of the mail slot. It's a double mail slot, so when the, you push it through, uh, the mail slot closes, but there's this quilt that insulates it. Um, the first three times the mailman looked and there was resistance there, but he had to pass it through some bubble foam slot that I, okay? <laughs> and so they left in the front door, so I have this little sign on my mailbox, please push mail through slot. Uh, <laughs> maybe I can put it on my Facebook page, what we did. But, but it, it would, there was a breeze coming through that door slot. I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, and, and it, it, the door is right in front of the stairway, so it's a breeze coming through the door and going up the stairway and, you know, up some leaky space in the home. You know, it, was, it was ridiculous. I found, um, <laughs> Um, when we got in the house, we have uh, um, uh, fiber files. And these guys come in and they drill a hole in your house and they have these wires there. And there was this big hole there. <laughs> they didn't bother filling up the hole and then put your hand over it and it's, it's huge stuff coming out. So, you know, you stuff in fiberglass and a little foam into the hole and it's gone, it's fixed. And th finding out where the leaks are and finding out where the insulation is a little thin this is huge. And so the, uh, the, the air conditioning and the winter heating bills of our house went down by a factor of two from the previous owner. Now part of it is we keep it cooler in, in the winter and we installed two ceiling fans so we allow the temperature to go up to let's say 78 in the summer, enough to dehumidify, but a, a very gentle ceiling fan breeze in 78 is very, very comfortable. Okay, so you don't, you don't fix it by just putting your thermostat at 72. Um, so that's part of the factor too, but a lot of the factors too is just getting rid of leaks. Okay, getting rid of leaks, heat leaks. As you can tell, this is something the secretary takes very personally. <laughs> uh, take a question from the audience. Hi, I'm secretary. My name is Drew Sloan. I'm with Opower. So we are very excited to hear you, your last comment. And I wonder if you could actually comment a bit about what the thinking is in the 2035 plan about how energy efficiency will factor in and what can be done on a federal mm -hmm. level when so many of the regulatory right. environments are created on the state level. Um, um, f there's f a couple of things. We are trying to give people the information they need in order to make the wisest investments. As I said before, we're trying to make it so that you can have access to capital low-cost capital over a long period of time. So you're going to have effectively energy like mortgages. We're trying to do those things. We're trying to pilot things where um, if you want to weatherize your home, you need a qualified audit. Uh, but if you do that, you don't really know. The typical homeowner doesn't know who to turn to. They might ask for estimates from a couple of people. You know, that also ends up going into the bill when you get a contractor to come, right? They, they got to drive out and then another one, and then, okay. So think, imagine a world where in your block there are maybe, you know, let's say there are 20 people on the block and five of them say, yeah, I think we can go into this. And there are known um, suppliers of this, the audit and the work that you could have confidence in. So a, uh, you know, a contractor has got a kind of a good seal of approval. Uh, they know you can you can do the right stuff, and you just, the business is now you, you you audit all five houses all at once. You you blow in the installation all at once, single truck. Okay, it's like when they install cable TV. What do they do? They try to line up lots of subscribers on that street before they trench. Okay, so we are piling programs like that because that will greatly reduce the cost. It will give consumer confidence uh, that this is a supplier, uh, this reputation stands behind this, uh, and there will be a number of them. Uh, it could be a syndicated thing like a true value type. It could be a Lowe's, a Home Depot-like thing. It could be a, there are a lot of opportunities. We put a call for proposals. I've got a very good response, and so we're going to be piling those things. Um, small business loans. There could be your business and you know you're throwing lots of money away on an efficient old leaky building. If you could only get the capital to do that, 
you could your business becomes more you know no out of pocket expense, but your business becomes much more efficient. Um, so there are a number of things like that. In the meantime, and those are known technologies. They're just mechanism for deploying it. But in the meantime, we're also very bullish in thinking of ways of using technologies we already know about in different sectors. As a, an example, today's automobiles uh, have dozens of computers. Those computers automatically adjust depending on the temperature of the engine, the temperature of the outside, the throttle position. They automatically adjust how much fuel goes into the piston, when the timing is, everything. They tune up your car on a second-by-second -second basis. No one actually has car tune-ups anymore, right? Because the computers do it. And when you need a car tune-up, what you really do is you take your car in the garage, and the garage's computer talks to your computer. And everybody just looks, and, okay? <laughs> and we can get buildings to do this that automatically tune up buildings. We already know that if you tune up a building before you uh, use it, you will save 10 plus percent of the energy, and then after 20 years, it's out of tune, you can retune it up and you will save a tremendous amount of energy. We have a technology to make it very, very simple, so you don't need to know the details, because it has to be simple, where the building tunes itself up. The, for example, we right now have a bunch of people in this room building consents very inexpensively using, happen to know this, use some, some cheap infrared technology to find out how much the CO2 is in this room, up the circulation, but after everybody leaves, you don't need to, you know, minimal circulation in this room, right? So that's a continual tune-up in a way that we think, because it's electronics, because it's computers, because it's sensors, will be very, very inexpensive. And, and, and to get those into systems, to get the computer design, so it automatically helps the architect and the structural engineer design, it, it has embedded energy efficiency designs in the programs. We design airplanes in such a way we can design buildings in that way, too. So, so there's a technology side. There's lots to be learned, but we already know a lot about things like sealing up air ducts. So we're running low on time here, so we're going to take one last uh, question from online. Uh, Lance LaCroix asks uh, via Facebook, when will uh, SMRs, small modular nuclear reactors, become viable, and what are your thoughts on distributed electrical distribution? Well, I'm, I'm a big fan of small modular reactors for a co and, and let me define it. These are uh, small nuclear reactors at a scale of, let's say, 100 megawatts, maybe 150, 200, or less. Um, why? Because if you build a small modular reactor, it used to be that you drive down the cost by building a very big reactor because there are certain fixed costs, approvals, things like that. And so the reactors have gotten very big. They're uh, uh, a gigawatt, a thousand megawatts of power to one and a half uh, gigawatts, uh, 1,500 megawatts of power. Uh, they cost a lot of money, typically seven, eight billion dollars. Uh, they need a huge inf electricity infrastructure to take that one and a half gigawatts of power. Um, if you think of your utility company and everything you have in project and all of a sudden you're going to have to invest $8 billion, that's a large part of the asset allocation <laughs> of your company. You may want, and so what people are doing now is, as we do, they're, they're again entering partnerships. If you, if you can develop, and so the economy of scale by making big because of all the uh, other procedures, if you can make them, stamp them out in a single factory, ship them around the United States and around the world, you, you go to an economy of numbers that compensates for the economy of scale. That means that sites which are only designed to have, let's say, uh, 500 megawatts of power, you can have two modules or three modules, and that's the way we do it with gas and coal. A certain number of turbines, and you size, right size it to the thing. And if it's stamped out identically, you have better control over the manufacturing because it's done in a factory prefab and it can be peer approved and, and so there are a lot of issues and it can be shipped internationally, very, very big deal. So we think uh, it solves a lot of issues um, in terms of the capital investment, the electricity infrastructure, and so I'm very gung-ho on this and we are trying to work and see if we can accelerate the development. And by the way, it's a way of the United States regaining its lead in nuclear technology. 
who built the first reactor in the world, Enrico Fermi. Uh, we were the leaders initially in nuclear reactors, but it, we are no longer the leaders. It's France and Japan and Korea. And now China wants to be the new leader. And so this is a way we can get back that technology lead. Okay. Well, thank you, Secretary Chu, and thanks for everyone uh, joining us in person and online. Um, this will be the first of a series of Energy Matters uh, online uh, chats and town halls, uh, both with Secretary Chu and other leaders here at the department. Uh, for those of you who had questions who we were not able to get to today, we'll be following up with uh, some answers uh, in the coming days. And so please do go ahead and continue the conversation online at energy.gov. Thank you. Hey, thank you.